Good evening. My name is Tim Neff, and I'm a Vice President and Director of Museum and Education at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum, located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I would like to welcome everyone this evening to our monthly program called Spotlight On, where we highlight different topics related to our mission and to the collection of artifacts that we have here at Soldiers and Sailors. Joining me tonight, as usual, is our curator, Michael Krauss. I'm going to bring Michael up now to say hi. How are you doing tonight, Michael? Hey, I'm good, Tim. Good to see you and uh, excited about tonight's program. Yes, I'm very excited about tonight. I think it's a topic that a lot of people have probably at least heard of. If you're from Pittsburgh, I bet you've heard of this, um, and there's a chance you may even know a little bit about it. Um, maybe if you're not, if you're from not uh, not from Pittsburgh, there's probably a good chance you've never heard of this. So um, we're happy to introduce this topic to some folks and to others. Maybe bring some new information um, that they did not know about beforehand. As I pull up our slideshow here, I'm just going to talk qu quickly about soldiers and sailors. If this is the first time you're joining us. Um, Soldiers and Sailors is a memorial hall and museum located in the Oakland neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, it was built back in 1910 as a Civil War memorial, uh, but today stands as a memorial in a museum that honors veterans from all wars. That's Civil War through present day. And we have a collection of thousands and thousands of artifacts that have been donated to us through the years by local men and women who served and their families. And we use these objects to tell their story and honor their service to our country. Uh, so if you haven't been to Soldiers and Sailors in a long time, I really encourage you to come visit. Even if you've been in here recently, we we'll always love to see you come back sometime. I will talk a little bit more about how you can visit Soldiers and Sailors and about some of our upcoming programs at the end of tonight's um, uh, class here about Spotlight On. As usual, we have uh, question and answers. If you're watching us on uh, Facebook, you can submit a comment and we'll see your question and uh, take our take a chance at the end to answer that. If you're watching us on YouTube, you do have to email us, soldiersandsailorspittsburgh at gmail.com. And if we uh, can, we'll try to answer that question during the program here. But if not, we'll have your email and we'll certainly get a response to you as soon as we can. Here we are. As I said, Michael Krause is our curator of collections and uh, there are myself, Tim Neff. And we're going to go ahead and jump right into it here, um, talking about the Allegheny Arsenal. And uh, we have a couple of photos here from the beginning and, and uh, more of the Civil War era. And Michael, what can you tell us about the, the photos that we're looking at here? Well, the photos show probably one of the most distinctive features of the arsenal. It, it does not exist today. It, 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 was, um, it was taken down around 1940. But the arsenal, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little later, um, but just for purposes of viewing this photo, um, was um, was divided in half by Butler Street, current day Butler Street, and uh, which is odd because this is a United States arsenal with ammunition and guns and soldiers and a public street runs right through the middle of it. Um, but what you're looking at is the gatehouse. Um, the gatehouse has a, a, tip, a very gothic look. Um, it doesn't date from the beginning of the arsenal. The arsenal uh, uh, came into existence around 1814. Uh, the gatehouse, uh, it's thought, was built due to its architecture shortly before the Civil War. That, that kind of uh, look was popular. But if you look in on the photo on the left, that was taken around 1862. And you can see in the little gatehouse, there are some soldiers, there are sentries uh, standing guard there. And um, we are, the camera's view is taken up uh, on top of a hill um, that overlooks the, I'm going to say the upper and lower arsenal, um, where today uh, Arsenal Middle School stands. It would be on the left there. Um, we also have a picture taken in 1915 of the same gate. And you can see um, um, it's uh, just typically, um, typically the same. I mean, it's very, nothing has changed is what I want to say. Um, and it, uh, uh, in fact, most of the Arsenal hasn't changed. There's a a building missing uh, from the first picture, which was a stables that's no longer there. But, you know, just to show a little little change in time from 1862 to 1915 is, is where we uh, where we're looking at. Yeah, and I think it's um, great to see these photos because I've seen photos close up of the gatehouse and didn't always quite understand its orientation. But uh, this really puts it into perspective with the uh, the Butler Street. We just talked about entrance, but we're looking uh, towards the river here. So it's the it's you know on Butler Street, kind of the gatehouse to the, to the lower part of the arsenal, you know, towards, towards the river there. 
That's right. And you can see the hill in the background. Right. That's on that's the other side really... of the river where yep. uh, Route 28 is now in Millville. Yep. It's on, it's, yeah. if you look to the right, Millville would be down there today. Yeah, not far from where I'm sitting right now. Okay. So here we have um, some closer up photos of the of the gatehouse. Yeah, some winter views, some dreary winter views in a dreary winter Pittsburgh day in 1915. Uh, these albums came from a, a little pile of photos in somebody's photo album. You know, we were uh, excited to see, uh, you know, that they were the Arsenal and it is dated. So that's uh, and it, at this point in time, the Arsenal is still um, a, a federal property, especially the lower part. So there's a, a storage of weapons, some administrative um functions that go on there, um, but it's still in, in its last days as a, as a United States facility. Yeah. And it looks like there on the photo on the left, you can almost see maybe like a trolley tracks down the middle of Butler yeah. Street. Is that, yeah, yeah you're right. right. There, was, there was a trolley track that ran down yeah. there. Yeah. So I mentioned before that um, the arsenal was built in 1814 or, or, or land was purchased and um, act of Congress uh, written to establish United States Arsenal at uh, Allegheny uh, in Pittsburgh. Now, you have to remember in 1814, this is still the wilderness. Uh, we're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, the War of 1812 is still, you know, sizzling and hot. And this would have been one of the U.S. Uh, Army's furthest um, arsenals uh, going west. And from this point, you know, things could be distributed uh, as needed if they were needed uh, to go um, down rivers or, or up towards Erie or whatever. Uh, so this is the arsenal is in, in pretty uh, wilderness, wilderness type, not populated as it is today. The, um, the land was purchased from a man named um, uh, William Barclay Foster. And Pittsburghers will know the name Foster as as people outside Pittsburgh uh, as well, because William Barclay Foster was Stephen Collins Foster's father. So Foster uh, Sr. was a land speculator and he bought uh, up all this land and sold um, this large 30 acre tract to the government. What you're looking at here are um, two buttons that were found uh, in the upper arsenal grounds. Um, and they are, from their 1814 buttons, and what you see is a, a cannon with an eagle on top, and it says uh, Artillery Corps. So these are um, among the oldest known um, pieces that relate to the arsenal and its military um, history. Right. Uh, there's a lot of things that happen at the arsenal. Um, we're going to talk in a bit uh, about probably one of the most famous. Uh, but before we get there, um, one, one, of the, um, one, of the, one of the gentlemen that passed through here um, was an en engineer officer in the Ordnance Corps, Ordnance Department, named Thomas Jackson Rodman. And Rodman um, was a thinking man, and he was, like I said, an engineer interested in uh, metallurgy. And Rodman, in, in his time here, did a study uh, visited a number of, um, of uh, iron foundries uh, around the country, and particularly here in Pittsburgh, the Fort Pitt foundry. And he was interested in finding a way to, um, to better the uh, casting process for making cannons. So what happened was um, when cannons were cast, um, they were cast sometimes in one big piece and then bored out uh, uh, the, the hole in the center was bored out uh, or uh, there was a core in there that, that came out later and um, they, it was drilled to accommodate the size of a cannon shell that would go in it. And the gun on the right um, shows the, um, the type of cannons that were being made all the way up to the Civil War. And the little red square is the bursting cavity. It's where the, where the charge went in. So what happens when, when guns were cast like that? When you think of molten metal being poured, um, the the proof in the pudding is how they cooled, because there's a different rate of cooling of mel mel molten metal, and that cooling produces imperfections in the metal. So these guns that were what, that were poured by the uh, pre-Rodman um, 
um, metallurgy uh, 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 method uh, had imperfections in them. And what they would do is they would test these guns. Um, they put them on a railroad car, shoot them up the river, um, and they would fire them into a hillside up there. And uh, they would do it as many times as it took to blow up the gun. So they were, they're going to actually try to, to blow this gun up and see how many shots they can get out of it. Now they're going to overload it with powder. They're going to overload it with shells, but a typical gun, uh, a cast iron gun uh, would, would start to, would start to break down after 85 or 90 shots. I mean, just break, uh, break in half, explode. So that, that's not a really good thing. So Rodman's guns, and if you look at the illustration on the right, he found a way, um, yeah, that's a pit that the form is in, and they built a fire inside the pit. When the molten metal comes in and fills the mold up and comes up, he introduced a cooling system where water was um, pumped in to chill the inside of the bore. Um, so it would cool at about the same rate as as the rest of the gun. And this proved to be a huge, um, huge improvement in metallurgy and technology. And Rodman guns um, um, could be fired in the same method when they were tested. Um, the first ones uh, they did would, would explode after like 250 shots. And some later ones, it could be uh, a thousand or more shots and they still did not burst. So here we're seeing a great advancement in technology by a guy who was at Allegheny Arsenal for 10 years, uh, who frequently visited the foundries here, um, who had who had cannons poured here. He had these giant guns that were poured here in uh, in Pittsburgh. So he's he's a pretty important man that that uh, advances technology and has uh, a foot at Allegheny Arsenal. Yeah, and you mentioned the uh, Fort Pitt Foundry, which today would have been located in what we know as the Strip District. And I think a lot of times you put those two together, the Fort Pitt Foundry and the Allegheny Arsenal, especially during the Civil War. And uh, it really speaks to the, the contributions of this region, aside from just the manpower, um, but also the production power as well. Yeah. So here we have a Columbia ad cannon. So, uh, yeah, so um, um, these guns, the reason we're... Uh, showing these guns. We're going to take a step past Jackson now. And um, in, at the arsenal, the arsenal didn't make cannons. They didn't make weapons. They didn't make guns, but they stored them. It was an arsenal. It was a place where those were shipped to and stored. And when needed, they could be um, dispersed wherever, wherever they had to go. And in 1860, with the war uh, just right on the horizon, um, Secretary of War John Floyd, who was a pro-Southern Secretary of War, had the idea to uh, have uh, the guns that were uh, that were um, trying to. There, uh, he, uh, he had uh, he had the guns that were stored at Allegheny Arsenal. He ordered them to be shipped by steamers south. And when I say um, uh, guns, I'm talking about 120 pound gun. So when we say 20 pound, that's the size of the cannonball, weighs 20 pounds. 120 uh, pound guns, um, 21 10 inch Columbiads. Columbiads is on the right. Uh, 21 8 inch Columbiads, four 32 pounder guns, 100 and some guns he ordered moved to the south. And uh, they were being taken down to the wharfs on the citizens of Pittsburgh from Allegheny Arsenal, it's where they were stored. The citizens of Pittsburgh heard what was happening, and um, it caused a great clamor in town to where uh, many of the citizens uh, protested the move. Uh, they, uh, they, they, contact, they, they contacted the president, uh, Buchanan, and uh, made him aware of what was going on, and they demanded that these guns not be sent south. So, so they were not sent south. Um, the order was reprimanded, and... Um, the guns were kept here. Now, I think is it our next slide? There were four 10-inch Columbiads in that pile, um, cast at Fort Pitt Foundry, that were uh, among the guns that were being taken to the wharfs to be sent south. 
four of them um, were sold when Allegheny Arsenal um, sold its inventory and they ended up um, uh, in, a, in a public park. And later uh, during World War II, two of them were melted down in a scrap drive and um, two of them um, came to Oakland. Um, they were down in front of the Frick first and then uh, they were moved to Soldiers and Sailors. So these are actually two of the guns that were supposed to supposed to have been shipped south um, in the um, in the order that um, that Floyd had done. Now, these are not guns that you would see on a battlefield. They're gigantic. That you can see um, the tube of this gun weighs fifteen thousand pounds, and the shell. There's a, a stack of shells or uh, on our on our lawn. They weigh 100 pounds each. So this is a coastal gun. These would go uh, in a coastal uh, area uh, to fire at uh, ships that were coming up into a harbor or whatever. But, um, you know, these are two historic guns cast at Fort Pitt Foundry, stored at Allegheny Arsenal, that now are part of uh, Soldiers and Sailors' front yard. Yeah, I always use them as a, a pretty important landmark. If you if you haven't been to Soldiers and Sailors or you don't know anything about us, if you're in Oakland, we're the big old building with the two cannons in front. It, it you can't miss us when you're when you're traveling through town. Um, I'm going to use some pieces in our collection that um, are associated with Allegheny Arsenal. This is a photograph of Major William Harris, um, and Harris was, um, there he is, where is he? He was a West Point um, graduate in the class of 1861. Now we all know that, um, you know, the war broke out in 61 and uh, 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 the, the uh, classmates who had been pro-Southern left. So there were, uh, the, the classmates actually graduated early in 1861 to get them out into the field uh, as officers. Uh, Harris was number eight in his class. Uh, now, this is the same class that had George Armstrong Custer, um, the famous uh, Civil War general uh, who became an Indian fighter who perished at the Little Bighorn in 1876. And Custer was in the class of 61, but he was dead last. He was uh, uh, dead last in the, in the 34th position of graduating. So aside from his photo, um, when you look to the right, you can see those are Harris's shoulder straps. Um, he was assigned to um, to a uh, heavy artillery uh, regiment, the 4th U.S. Heavy Artillery. He fought at the Battle of Bull Run, uh, the first Battle of Bull Run. And after that, he served as an ordnance officer, uh, kind of shuffled himself around to different um, arsenals and sites. And in 1864, he was stationed at uh, Allegheny Arsenal. Um, the other insignia you see, uh, the center one on the bottom is uh, crossed cannons. Um, that's an artillery insignia. And then there are two uh, oak leaves on the right and left of that. Those are what we call subdued insignia. They're smaller, uh, not as flashy, and usually worn on um, kind of your everyday clothes and not your more dressy clothes, your fatigue clothes. So we have that piece of Harris, and we have another piece, which is a, a presentation sword that was given to him by the members of the 4th U.S. Uh, Heavy Artillery. Uh, so you can see on the scabbard, the scabbard is brass um, in the center between the two rings. It has presented to Major William H. Harris by the members of, um, of Company L, um, of Company E, 4th U.S. Heavy Artillery. And uh, is, there, is there another picture of the sword? No, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so, no. Okay, so if you look at the top, I mean, this is a beautiful sword. It has a silver handle, um, silver decorated handle. And the quillion, that's that little piece that comes down uh, around the guard, has a little eagle's head. And in the eyes of the eagle's head are two rubies. So it was an expensive sword. You can also see on the right how um, fancy the blade is. It's, uh, it's etched, it's acid etched, and it has gold highlightings. Uh, so it's a, it's a very, very beautiful sword. Uh, prized by him and certainly uh, was used by him when he was at Allegheny Arsenal. The Arsenal, like I said, they did not, they did not make guns. They did not uh, pour metal. Uh, they, what they did 
was they built um, cavalry saddles in sets, the saddle, the bridle, the martingale, the crupper, um, the saddlebags. Uh, they built um, artillery hardware for um, harnesses, uh, all the straps that takes to uh, that lead uh, that that join the horses together, the four team horses, um, and um, they also made uh, carriages for the cannons. That, that's the wooden parts with the wheels and the caisson and and the limber chests, which are the chests that were full of ammunition. So one of the things we have, which is I've never seen another one, and I think this is really quite a wonderful piece, is this little folding wallet-looking uh, piece on the right left-hand side. And what it is is it's a um, it, it has artillery harness buckle prototypes in it. And this would have been kept at the arsenal. Uh, this is uh, how they, when they inspected the artillery harness um, and anything they made, they had these sets of uh, approved samples that they could go out and measure against and make sure everything was coming up to the standards that had been approved by the quartermaster corps um, and um, and would fit all the different um, all the different um, harnesses and cannon equipment that the government made. So this is a pretty neat thing. And and if you look at the center picture, these are two buckles that were found on the arsenal ground uh, in the dirt. Um, and you look at the top one and it's identical to one of the harness buckles. It is, it is in fact a harness buckle that um, was lost or, or came apart or uh, maybe didn't meet, meet specifications. The second one is also a harness buckle. It's just not in our kit. And on the right-hand side, uh, the, the very shiny buckle you see is um, a model 1839 cartridge box plate. This would have been, it's a small US plate that goes on a leather cartridge box. Um, that one is, um, it's an original, but um, it was um, very well preserved. The one, the one under it, however, was found at the arsenal by someone who gave it to us. Uh, they found it um, near one of the stone walls, which I find is very curious. Um, but it's, it's, it's in kind of rough shape, but again, it's from the arsenal. So um, to me, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> so what they did at the arsenal, and this is probably the, this is leading up to why we're giving this program in September. Um, one of the big functions of the, at the Allegheny Arsenal was making ammunition. Ammunition at the time was made, um, uh, special right, especially rifle ammunition or musket ammunition, was made by hand. Uh, what I mean by that, where there were components that were set out on tables, and then that was assembled into a cartridge. Now, those cartridges were made out of um, gunpowder, paper, and string. So you can see in the top illustration, um, a tube is formed around a, a cylinder stick. It's tied with a string, um, the, they call it the blossom end, is kind of pushed down to compact that. The tube is slid out. Um, the bullet is slid into the tube. It fits it precisely. Um, then uh, gunpowder is poured in and another string is tied to separate, kind of physically separate the powder and the ball. So in the illustration on the right, you can kind of see where the, where the ball is and the powder. And these are three different kinds of cartridges. Um, this is a round ball, a musket ball. Um, they came in a 69 caliber, which is the largest caliber that, that we used. Um, uh, and the second one is called bucket ball. So you have a, a large uh, musket ball and two pieces of buckshot. Um, so when, uh, I'm sorry, three pieces of buckshot. So when, when that's fired, when you load those buckshot in the ball in, you get three pieces like a shotgun and one piece like a uh, like a bullet. That was very effective at close range. At a range of 50 yards, 75 yards, a regiment firing buck and ball um, could re really destroy a target, uh, whether it be the enemy or whatever they were shooting at. And the, uh, the, the uh, one on the right is purely all buckshot. Um, it's like a shotgun cartridge, um, not as popular as the, the, the first two on the 
on the left, but these were being produced at Allegheny Arsenal. Well, let's move to the next slide. So um, who was going to make these cartridges? Well, it was believed it, it was a it was a very um, meticulous operation. It took a lot of skill to roll that cartridge, tie it tightly, make the blossom in, fill it, and fold it over. It was believed at the time that women were more uh, suitable for doing work like that because they had very fine motor skills from. Um, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm only using the, uh, the example given at the time uh, from doing close up work like needlepoint, sewing, stitching. In other words, they thought that this was an advantage and women could make these cartridges. Um, so you see a table of women um, at their stations. Uh, they would have, again, um, powder, the tubes. The tubes had been pre-rolled and brought down to them, the paper tubes. Those are in front of the ladies in the box. Um, they would they would roll and tie a cartridge, and then they would be uh, laid in boxes. And you can see some of the boxes behind them. the uh, the right The photograph on the right are actually original Allegheny Arsenal cartridges um, that were rolled at Allegheny Arsenal um, that we have in our collection. One, um, the first two on the left have been kind of taken apart, so you can see um, the round ball and you can see um, the the uh, the uh, mini ball, which is um, and they call it an elongated ball or a mini ball, which was an improvement over the round ball. It it fired those rings you see grabbed the inside of the riflings, and it could fire faster and straighter, not faster, but more accurately and straighter than the round ball. And the third one is a complete cartridge. Uh, you see that tail on the on the bottom. That's really important when you when you put them in your cartridge box. The tail sticks up on the top, so when you reach back, you can pull it out without even looking. It's a good way to, to grab that tail. Uh, and uh, during the war, um, it wasn't uncommon. In fact, um, uh, there are reports uh, that daily production was 124,000 rifle and musket cartridges per day. So this Allegheny Arsenal is pumping out the stuff. Not only that, but they're not only making... Um, musket and rifle ammunition, there are shells. And shells are, uh, it's, a, it's a round ball. We, a lot of people say it's a cannonball, but really it's called spherical case. It's a hollow cannonball. And those were loaded with uh, musket balls in, um, in like pitch, which is like a tar or a, a pine pitch. And with a, they would load an explosive charge in there and then set a fuse. So they were m making cartridges and loading spherical case next yeah and we'll we'll see some examples of those spherical cases here in just a little bit yeah here. yeah yeah so here are some men um, working um, now these these places they worked they were they were called laboratories Allegheny Arsenal had uh, several laboratories and um, uh, in those that's where the uh, the uh, the loading processes were were done so you see some men I want you to notice, um, this is the days before OSHA and before safety standards. And this is black powder that they're rolling. Um, they have a tray to catch some of it, but uh, obviously there's going to be black powder that's spilling and leaking places. And that's going to be a problem. And how they address that is going to be a problem. Powder came in a barrel like the one you see on the right. And those barrels were stored at the... Um, um, at the oh uh, the the stone um, ammunition um, can't think of the name of it uh, place uh, that's still that's still there at uh, Al at Allegheny Arsenal um, and um, there were there were hundred pound I mean hundreds of these hundred pound barrels there in order to get them to the laboratory uh, one or two men would load them on a on a cart a horse drawn cart and then drive the cart to the laboratory, take the barrel off, set it on the porch. And from there, um, it would be brought in in powder magazine. Thanks, Rich Condon. <laughs> I had, a, I had a, a, a slip of the mind. So uh, the powder magazine is where the powder was kept. So these barrels were then set on the porch, brought in, opened up and um, distributed to the various stations. So what was, what was bad about that 
was the, you can see this is a wooden barrel and they, the arsenal was required by the DuPont company to return these barrels and have them refilled again. And in the many times that they went back and forth, uh, they got loose. The lids didn't fit on them very good. Um, there were reports of, um, you know, as, as the, as the barrel was in the cart being transported to the lab, uh, shaking, powder leaking, powder leaking on the road. Um, so I'm building up to a crescendo and, and we're going to, we're going to learn what's going to happen here at Allegheny County. But keep in mind what's happening in the lab, who's in there, and this situation of this very explosive powder that they're working with. Um, these, are, uh, these are a couple more bullets uh, on the left that are in our collection. Um, one thing I wanted to show, this is a very interesting piece owned by a private collector um, that was found at Allegheny Arsenal. Um, um, it's a bullet reamer. And that reamer was, was screwed onto the side of the table and a tray of bullets was, was somebody's job to have a tray of bullets and then um, ream it with that little reamer to make sure that the, the cavity inside was the proper shape and it flattened the shoulder of the bullet to make it, make it um, perfectly fit. So that's a, it's a very unusual tool. And we've, we've just really learned about this tool. Um, but that would have been a tool that was inside of the laboratories and being used. Uh, this is spherical case. Tim had told you we were going to look at this. Um, it's uh, if you look at the right hand side, you can see it has a cavity inside, a hollow cavity. It's a it's in the uh, cutaway view. Has uh, you can see the walls of the shell, and you see the musket balls that are cut in half, and the cavity in the middle is where the where the charge was going to be. And if you look on the top, that, that square shaped piece is actually the fuse. And you can see it better on the left hand cannonball. It's a fuse made out of zinc. And that was the last piece that went to put the cannonball together. It's screwed into the top. There are threads in there. And the fuse has numbers on it, one, two, three, four, five. And those indicate um, how many seconds uh, would, uh, would be needed for the fuse to ignite and explode the cannonball. And that fuse, those seconds were set uh, in the field before the, before the cannonball was fired, um, a gunner with instructions from um, the chief of the piece, the person in charge of the, the gun, um, he would punch a hole in one of those numbers. And when it left the tube, it would have one to five seconds before it exploded. So there were, there were numbers of these at Allegheny Arsenal. In fact, in 1971, um, so, see the 71 or 72, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, the bottom half of the arsenal um, had been long since sold and it was being developed. And, and when they were digging foundations, they ran into an underground foundation that had uh, uh, hundreds of cannonballs in them. And uh, that was 1971. And then in 2017, when they were making way for the, for the new uh, apartments that are down there. Again, they hit a foundation, opened it up, and there were 715 cannonballs in it. And in 2020, again, dur during construction, they um, they found uh, over a thousand cannonballs. And we were lucky enough. Uh, well, imagine, first of all, you're, a, you're on a backhoe and you're digging and you, you scrape off the ground and there are, there's this hundreds of cannonballs stacked together. Well, immediately the, sh the site gets shut down. Uh, the bomb squad comes in. Uh, the bomb squad um, surveys it. Then the army is brought in because this is army ordinance. And it was a, it was a big process to um, safely get those, um, those cannonballs out of the, uh, out of the um, foundations. And they were transported uh, by the army out east where they were uh, exploded. Um, they were live. Um, I, at the end of the process, the bomb squad managed to um, keep, uh, I think they got 12 of them, and they brought four of them to us. Um, and when the uh, officer brought them, he showed me on his cell phone um, where they had drilled out a shell, they tapped out the powder, 
and ignited it. And it was, it was live. I mean, these were live cannonballs. So um, lucky they're found and they're not underneath a, a big sprawling uh, um, condo <laughs> or apartment complex right now, but uh, they were nice enough to give us four of them in the four different sizes that they found. And you can see them here on display in a, in our museum in our Civil War artillery uh, exhibit here. So the reason now for, for our event, right? This is what we've been this, leading up to. Here we go. So the arsenal, and I kind of painted a picture. Um, the top, the top right is um, the laboratories. They were simple wooden buildings. Um, they were heated uh, on the right hand side. There was an engine house that had um, a steam boiler and water was pumped in tubes through the ground um, and around the uh, laboratories that kept it warm. And they couldn't have an open flame in those rooms. You saw the, the gunpowder. So this is a way of heating them. Um, the uh, building in between them was the wardrobe room where the women came uh, in fact, they're, they're mostly women working here. I, I said that before. The other thing I meant to say was they were um, mostly immigrants, uh, Irish uh, and German. Um, and these were, this is at a time when uh, there was really no work for women. W women weren't being employed in a lot of places. So working at the arsenal and getting paid by the peace was a big deal. Um, so there were, uh, there were quite a number of women that were working there. I, there were... Um, 156 girls working um, at the uh, at making cartridges, and the arsenal at the time had employed uh, over a thousand people. Uh, not all women, but um, over a thousand people in in uh, running the affairs of the war. On the left hand side is a a period plot map of the arsenal. It's in blue. So on the top side. If you would continue outside of where that little angle goes, that's the Allegheny River. That's the bottom, the lower arsenal where the administration buildings are, the carriage making, harness making, all that's down there. Butler Street dividing it in the center. The upper arsenal is where the ammunition is going to be made. And if you follow, uh, it's between 39th and 40th Street. Um, 39th Street was called Pike Street. And I don't remember what 40th Street was called, but if you follow it up 40th Street, um, about halfway up, you'll see the position where the um, laboratories were. A good way to mark that today is the powder magazine. Um, if that's the L-shaped building that's up there. And um, if you're familiar with the uh, arsenal, there's like a cement, uh, looked like it might have been a pond at one time. Kids use it to skateboard and, and uh, do things there now. It was a pond uh, during, the, during the time of the arsenal operation, and it was going to play a role in what's going to happen here. So what, what happens in, in the picture on the bottom um, center is the, uh, you can see the laboratories. There's the, um, on the right-hand side of that picture is the powder magazine. And um, again, powder would be taken from there and brought to the labs. Um, the one that's shaped like a star, like a cross, is the one we're going to be looking at. So in our illustration, let me just say first, on it's September 17th, 1862. Um, that's why we're doing this program in September, to remember this event. But it also is a major day in uh, Civil War history, being uh, that the Battle of Antietam is being fought on this very same day um, that the, this incident is going to occur. Um, the Battle of Antietam is the bloodiest day, single day um, battle in, in the Civil War history. And um, what's going to happen at Allegheny Arsenal is uh, those powder kegs that are being brought up uh, on those shaky carts. And we're going to look a little bit later at the roadway, the construction of the roadway that they were coming on. You'll see how it was jostling and powder would shake out. A um, couple barrels are put on, on the uh, back of porch number one. Um, somehow, um, somehow a spark ignited loose powder that was outside of the, on the ground. And it, it transmitted to the barrels that were on the back porch. And it, it blew the first laboratory up. Um, when you look at that, um, 
the first room. That's where most of the casualties are going, going to happen. <clears throat> so uh, there were three explosions. Um, room number 12, as you see right across from there, exploded next. And um, some of the explosion was transmitted uh, to room 14. Now, the, the rooms uh, 1 and 12 are going to have the most casualties. Um, the buildings are on fire. Uh, the girls who are in there um, who didn't die immediately are trying to get out. Uh, they're jumping out of windows. They're badly burned. Um, it was a, a very horrible sight. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Oh, well, let's, let's go back. I'm not quite ready for that. So um, there, there's um, loss of life is 78 people, um, mostly when I say girls, I'm talking that a lot of the women employees were 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, they were, uh, like, like we said, horribly mutilated. There were, um, um, here one account says, um, one of the workers remembered the pandemonium. Two girls behind me, they were on fire. Their faces were burning, blood running from them. I pulled the clothes off one of them. While I was doing this, the other one ran up and begged me to cover her. I did not succeed in saving either one. So the people who were not killed outright, there's going to be a number of, of these women who are burned so badly um, that they will die in the next few days. Um, like I said, there's 78, 78 casualties, um, mostly, mostly women and young girls. And we'll look a little closer at some of their names later, but let's look at the next slide. So when I talked about the road um, from the powder magazine to the, um, to the laboratory, um, it was a road that was uh, called a macadam road. And a macadam road, if you look on the left-hand slide, is a, is a road that is made of like compacted stones. Um, you know, it was something... Um, it was, it was an improvement over a mud road. And the road before it was McAdam was, was dirt and mud and, and uh, very difficult to navigate. Um, so the arsenal uh, improved it with a McAdam road. But you can see how, how bumpy that would be in a horse cart. Um, one, of the, one of the theories to how the arsenal, how the spark started the fire at the arsenal was uh, one of the one woman in another laboratory across had noticed um, fire coming from underneath the horse cart. She noticed fire traveling uh, in the macadam because there was a lot of loose powder there. And from her description, and it was confirmed by one other person, it was believed that um, the horse hoof wearing an iron shoe like the one on the right there. Uh, struck the macadam stone, causing it to spark, which set off um, the powder. Um, what you see in the second picture, those are stones that came from the macadam road um, up in the arsenal um, where there was some excavating being done. Uh, you, they're all about the same size. They're all about two inches thick. They were pieced in and put in. The black that you see on that those two stones that's powder. It, it's still stuck to the to the stones. And the uh, photo on the right, upper photo, um, when a trench was dug there, uh, you can see part of the Macadam Road, and then six or seven inches of powder that are below that. And that was that was brought up in the um, that was brought up in the hearings. Um, one of the workers said uh, he saw a powder an inch thick on the stones. And uh, um, when, when the stones were dug up under them was, uh, was black powder um, that was half a foot thick. And, you know, looking at this excavation, some of it was still there. Um, also in that excavation, this horseshoe popped up. Now, is it, is it the, the famed horseshoe that started the explosion? Probably not, but... It just came from exactly in that same area, and um, one can only one can only wonder if if it had anything to do with it. But um, what so what they would do is um, with all that loose powder at the end of the day they would just sweep it out the back porch. 
and sometimes throw water on it. Um, this is not powder that jiggled out of the um, of the cask, but this is powder that had accumulated in the labs. It was supposed to be recycled. It was supposed to be taken care of, but oftentimes it was just swept out uh, onto the back porch and just um, doused with water or just left out there. And um, uh, there's still remnants of it you can see today. Let's go to the next one. So um, the explosion was very um, fast, um, tragic, hot. Um, the pond that I talked about earlier, um, a lot of uh, open ammunition crates were, uh, were being uh, taken out of uh, the burning buildings that were still being burned and thrown into the pond. There were two reservoirs up above the pond, just a little above, that held water. Uh, Allegheny Arsenal had its own fire engine. So that, that fire engine was hooked up to the reservoirs and water was pumped on the, uh, on the burning buildings to put the fire out. Um, every once in a while, um, some things come out of the ground that, that are parts of the explosion. Um, on the left is uh, two melted bullets that are conjoined. Um, the centerpiece, you can see the rings in it, and that's a melted bullet. So that, that bullet was most likely in the arsenal uh, laboratory when it exploded and was hot enough to almost puddle. The other piece, um, I have it right here actually, is, um, where's my camera? A piece of lead. And I, I, I found this really interesting because right there, right, right there, see that? That is a percussion cap. So a percussion cap is a little tiny, little tiny cap like this. And that cap comes with, uh, is what fires the musket. When cartridges are rolled, they're bundled in a package of 10. And in that package of 10, there would be another little paper tube. And in that tube, there would be 12 musket caps because uh, possibility a, a cap could be fouled and not fire. So they gave you a couple extra ones that, that um, were extra. There's another cap right there, right there. This piece of lead has four musket caps in it. So undoubtedly this was part of um, a pack of cartridges that melted and um, it, it took the shape of the dirt it was in but the caps uh, were intact, and they're still uh, part of this part of this piece of lead. Really, really, um, in my opinion, takes you back to that afternoon on September seventeenth, eighteen sixty-two. I mean, this is a result, a direct result of that explosion. Okay, let's move on. Let's see what we got. Oh, there's here's some more um, melted lead on the left. A um, couple melted bullets. Uh, different calibers. They were making 69 caliber uh, the ammunition. They were making uh, 58 caliber ammunition. They were making uh, 52 caliber ammunition for Sharps carbines and rifles. And and the small one you see down there with a like a little nail. That 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 little nail object would fit up inside. That's called a clean out bullet. Um, and that was a bullet. There was uh, there was one or two that came in each pack. Um, and that little uh, ring on the bottom, uh, when the bullet was fired, was supposed to expand and scrape the inside of the barrel out. Now, whether it did, soldiers hated them um, because if they rammed that bullet down and uh, there was no opportunity to fire, um, they, they had to uh, extract it. And it wasn't uncommon to extract a round that um, was not fired. But those rounds, when they got smashed in with a ramrod, were very difficult to get out. So soldiers did not really like those rounds, but there's, they were being produced at Allegheny Arsenal too. The Arsenal did make bullets. They had a machine, a swaging machine, which was would take a, a bar of lead and kind of um, smash, smash a bullet shape. Uh, they, in other words, it wasn't poured with hot lead. They were compressed and, and under uh, uh, pressure and, and a bullet was made like that. So these bullets were being made at Allegheny Arsenal. Um, the, the piece on the right is a, a big hunk. It's about like that. 
and you can see um, kind of uh, melted bullets that are inside of that. That can be, that's it, soldiers and sailors, you can view that piece. It's part of our collection. Mike, just as a heads up, we are coming up on about 10 minutes left. On okay, our, on our we got to fly. Okay. Yeah, we're, okay. because I know I want to get to the to the letters and things as well. Okay. Yeah, these are shots of, uh, of, of the powder in the ground. Um, that's an 1862 penny that came out of the site. We can move ahead. Um, these, these letters um, were donated to us uh, two years ago uh, by a family in town. Um, and you can imagine uh, my thrill when I saw the covers of the letters uh, written to uh, Miss B. Hodge, Arsenal Post Office, Allegheny, PA. And if you look at the map on the right, um, Pike Street, which is 39th. Um, this is this is the area between uh, Butler and the river. On the left-hand side, about the fifth or sixth house down is the house of Bridget Hodge. And that's where these letters were being mailed to. Um, the letters were mailed by a soldier in the 9th Pennsylvania uh, Volunteer Infantry, uh, 9th Reserves. Let's go to the next one. Um, and there are maybe 10 or 12 letters. Uh, interesting. He's writing to um, uh, his mom and, um, and sister Bridget. And uh, just by uh, perusing the dates of the letters, um, I always look for important dates. This is the, uh, this is the last uh, letter that he writes. Um, he was wounded at the Battle of South Mountain on September 14th which is a few days before the battle. Well, it's the anniversary today, uh, September 14th. Uh, a few days before the Battle of Antietam, he was wounded in the arm. He, he talks about his wound. He's, gonna, he's getting better. He's being well taken care of. But this letter is written on September 24th. So this is after the Battle of Antietam, after the explosion. And what he says, um, he's writing to his mother from Capitol, uh, from Capitol Building hosp in the hospital. Um, He's writing to his mother about, his mother had written to him about the explosion. And on the right-hand side, um, he says, uh, received your welcome letter, dear sister, this is a sister. I feel as though I do not want to come home now. It appears to me that all my friends is gone. I am heartily sorry for the poor girls that suffered such a death. I write a few lines, so as you know, write so I, again, write so, write so I write again, they are all going to send me to a, he's talking about where he's going. That's couldn't read that word. My arm is getting along well. So he's writing out to his sister. And, um, and then there was another on the back of one of the letters. Uh, he writes, I received a, a letter from Bridget yesterday morning. She gave me an account of the accident. It is, a, it was an awful thing. I feel heartily sorry for the poor girls that fell victim. Now in some of his earlier letters, he, um, he, he, he writes and says, tell so-and-so, you know, he, he gives messages to the girls that um, were his, his sister's friends. One of them uh, that he names was killed in the explosion. So he doesn't know that yet. He doesn't have a list, but he knows that um, something bad has happened. And what happens to him? Um, he dies in October of his wound. So he does not come home. This is a piece of... Um, the uh, large um, uh, main building um, in the arsenal when it was torn down in 1918. Uh, souvenir pieces were uh, made into desk sets. This is in our collection. You can see that. Next. So um, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about memorialization. I'm going to just kind of see if I can fly through this. Um, um, there were... Um, uh, there were uh, 78 workers, um, 54 were unidentifiable. So only a few were identifiable. And, and the unidentifiable ones were um, buried in a mass grave. Each one, or as much of one uh, person that they had, were placed in coffins in the Allegheny Cemetery, where there is a, a monument, a single monument, and on the side of it um, is, um, is this uh, epitaph. Um, in the, one, of the, one of the women who was um, identified, this is the only photograph known of a woman who was identified 
as I killed uh, Fredelina Neckerman. But the side of the uh, the side of the monument is very touching. It says, "Tread softly." This is consecrated dust. Forty-five pure victims lie here. A sacrifice to freedom and civil liberty. A horrid moment of most wicked rebellion. Patriots. These are patriots' graves. Friends of humble, honest toil. These were your peers. Fervent affection kindled these hearts. Honesty, industry employed these hands. Widows and orphans' tears have watered this ground. Female beauty and manhood's vigor commingle here, identified by man, known by him who is the resurrection and the life, to be made known and loved again when the morning cometh. So very, very touching monument that's there. Some of the girls, next slide, that were identified were buried at St. Mary's Cemetery, which is right next door and almost within view of the, of the large uh, monument to the unknown. Uh, these are a few of them. Um, um, as, as you see, there's uh, on the bronze one, it, it, it lists Ellen McKenna uh, killed at the uh, Pittsburgh Arsenal explosion. So uh, it does make note of that. Uh, there's a couple more slides of, um, of uh, graves. Um, these were ones I could find um, that, were, uh, that were buried there. The one on the left um, um, was um, uh, McBride was the uh, was one of the superintendents. His daughter was killed in the explosion. He went in to try to get her and he couldn't. Um, so she she was identified. She's buried there. And years later, he was buried with her uh, on upon his death. We have another one. Yeah, and this is also, I think, Mike, where you made a point to me that, uh, you know, these are just family plots. I mean, it kind of harkens back to, the, you know, these were immigrant families, um, you know, not wealthy, you know, not the wealthy elite, of course, of Pittsburgh. And um, so, the, you know, the, the the ones on the right there especially are just, you know, literally family plots. So these specific names aren't listed there. We just know that they were buried yeah. there as, you know, as a part of that family plot. Yeah. Um, I just want to do say one more thing. I know. I know we're running right. You're up good. Against. You're right. Okay, um, um, in the in the casualties, uh, there were uh, I found just by looking at um, statistically, uh, there were um, there were 22 that were siblings or parent and child. So 22 of them were related to each other. Uh, well, eight eight were parent or child. 22 were siblings. So there's you know uh, it was a disaster. In other words, to whole families where a mother and child would be killed or two sisters would be killed. So, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd imagine most of the people that worked there obviously walked there probably. So yeah, back oh, yeah. to that letter that we read, you know, how that that soldier, even though he didn't know, you know the names at that time, probably had a sense that there were people he knew because he lived yeah. right there. And yeah. so did most of the people that worked there. Yeah. I'm certain he had the feeling of dread that he, he absolutely knew one that, that yeah. uh, suffered there. So a lot of nice comments this evening. Um, you know, Paul Lawson, hi there uh, from Virginia. How are you doing, Paul? Nice to join us. Um, he did ask about um, the Arsenal Gatehouse. Was it built around the same time as the nearby Allegheny Cemetery Gatehouse? Um, I think the Cemetery Gatehouse was built later in the 70s, but, you know, roughly within a uh, decade or two of it. You yeah. know, Pittsburgh had a lot of Gothic architecture, so um, it uh, – it, um, it proves, you know, it kind of ties in with the architecture. It, and it does really, really look like the gatehouse architecture. Yeah, I, I think I had them confused for a while. So when I first moved here in some of the early photos, I was getting them confused myself. Um, hi, Brandon. One of our old interns says hello. Uh, thank you for joining us, Brandon. We also have a lot of great comments from a KC Kirkman. Um, he did ask about the um, sword and Antietam that you worked on. Did you happen to use the eagle head? That you mentioned from the sword earlier, did you use that um, as a basis for the sword that you did in Antietam? Um, the sword I, I remade um, at Antietam with Chris I did have an eagle head on the on the quillion. Um, very not the model that I used. I had another one to use. You used a different one for that one. I used a different one. Yeah, yeah. but very similar. Very very similar. Good. Uh, we had uh, Rich Conan, of course, came through. He does point out that Colonel John Symington, who was uh, the man in charge uh, at the time, right, at, at the arsenal mm -hmm. that, you know, I know he was the one that stood trial for the uh, for the explosions, estimated 125,000 small arm cartridges 
and 175 rounds of field ammunition assorted for 12 pounder and 10 pounder powered guns exploded at the laboratory site. So just to give you an idea of the sheer uh, volume of pieces that could have been a part of that explosion um, that, you know, I'm sure still are in the grounds to this day, as he says, there's a lot out there. So, and um, Carolyn Hazer, hello. She says, uh, Mike, as interesting as always, miss you. Uh, Thank you for joining us. And thank you everybody for joining us. But before we wrap up, I do want to just talk a little bit about soldiers and sailors. Um, We, of course, are open to walk-in guests at any time. Our regular hours are Monday through Saturday, 10 to 4. You can come and visit us and and tour yourself. You can also schedule a guided tour. You just have to do that ahead of of time. Give us a call to, um, you know, make sure you can get a guided tour at the time that you would like. Our next Tabletop Gamers is coming up next Saturday, September 23rd. And I know they're going to be talking about the Italy campaign in World War II. They'll be playing games uh, related to that. We'll also have a woman, um, um, uh, Valerie Vacula, will be there. Her husband, her uh, dad was in uh, the Italian campaign, and she wrote a book about his experiences. So she'll be there sharing her book. So not only will they be gaming, but there'll also be some good conversations at that time. Um, our next Rad Day is Tuesday, October 10th. Rad Days are free admission. We just had one this past Tuesday. Our next one will be on Tuesday, October 10th. So if you are looking for a good time to come and save a little bit of money, October 10th will be a great day to come and visit us. This weekend, very busy weekend here at Soldiers and Sailors, we have uh, the Gold Star Wall Tribute will be on our grounds both uh, uh, September 16th and September 17th. It is a wall with a gold star for every fallen soldier post 9-11. And uh, you can come and pay your respects and uh, and visit this grand site. Um, it will be on our front lawn, as I said, this over weekend, along with the Vietnam Veterans Vigil will be taking place this weekend. Um, so a lot happening uh, that you can come see coming up on this Saturday and Sunday. You can also come and see our dog tag installation exhibit, which uh, we have done the last, I think this will be our third year of doing this. And we have a... Uh, dog tags hanging above our walkway that uh, are in honor of all those that have fallen once again, post 9-11 soldiers that had been killed in action. And there's thousands of dog tags that are suspended above our walkway. And if you haven't seen this in the past couple of years, I really encourage you to come see it. It'll be up through the month of September into October and you can come and it's, it's just a really a sensory experience. You see the dog tags, of course, you hear the dog tags as they are clinging together um, you know, the sun hits them if you're there during the daytime. It is a very powerful and moving exhibit that uh, you don't even have to come into our building. There's no admission for this. There's no admission as well for the Gold Star Wall. I really encourage you to come out this weekend. You can see everything all at once. You can see the dog tags uh, suspended. You can see the Gold Star Wall, the vigil, and also uh, see the museum as well. So um, we're kind of at a good time here. This just with doing it tonight to promote some of these great happenings coming up this weekend. Next month will be a spotlight on the history of soldiers and sailors. Uh, I can't believe we haven't done this one before for as long as we've been doing spotlight on it kind of is a no brainer, but we thought we'd introduce everybody to the history of this, the building, the soldiers and sailors structure and you know how that's evolved through the years and the nonprofit organization and the kind of history of how that evolved and came about uh, in the year 2000 and forward. So we'll get into some of our early history and then some of our more you know, some of the big changes that have happened through the years. I think it's important because a lot of people can hear the name soldiers and sailors and think a lot of different things and have a lot of different thoughts of what that means. Oh, I've been there for this, or I've been there for that. And we're going to make sure that we, you know, kind of outline how that is, uh, has happened through the years and how things have changed in and around Oakland for us. So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining tonight. Uh, I know it was a beautiful night here in in Pittsburgh. So if you took the time to sit and and learn from Michael, uh, I really appreciate it. Michael, I appreciate all your knowledge as always. And uh, what what an important topic to Pittsburgh history, um, to to Civil War history. And as you said, because it took place on the same day as the Battle of Antietam, so many people don't know about it. And I think it's just great to bring any attention that we can to this topic. So with that, Michael, thank you so much. Everybody out there, thank you for joining us. I hope everybody has a wonderful evening, and I hope to see you this weekend at Soldiers and Sailors.